um, to uh, talk about our experience in building a digital community archive in rural Colorado. So in our presentation, we'll describe a collaborative digitization project in Park County, uh, Colorado. And we'll discuss the challenges of sustaining community um, archives. Uh, my name is Christina Matuzak, and I'm a faculty uh, in the LIS program at the University of Denver. I served as a project coordinator um, for uh, the project that we are uh, talking about today. I would like to recognize other project team members, our wonderful graduate students uh, who have worked with me on the project, Alexandria Cord and Wendy Arrow, who are presenting with me today. And another student, Kelly uh, Cherry, also contributed to this um, presentation. Before we talk about our specific project, I would like to provide some background about community archives since they are different from uh, established institutional archives. Community archives play an important role in preserving the documentary heritage of a region or groups of individuals who define themselves based on shared identities or cultural backgrounds. These archives are often organized by volunteers and represent grassroots activities um, uh, aimed at, at preserving the culture of those groups in rural areas, archives contribute to shaping community identity and resilience, but they also demonstrate mixed and quite complex acquisition and curation uh, practices. And obviously that's a, that's a challenge for um, sustainability of those projects. So sustainability refers generally to organizational ability to continue operations beyond the initial foundational efforts. And in the case of community archives, it really means maintaining the collections at adequate organization and preservation levels and offering services to community. There are several sustainability risks that relate um, to governance, funding, staffing in the context of community archives. It's challenging to sustain volunteer efforts often beyond the lifespan of funders with limited budgets and often no formal organizational uh, structure. In addition, archival and digitization practices pose some sustainability risk. The post-custodial approach that is often practiced in community archives separates the physical custody and digital surrogate. So in the scan and return approach, Materials are digitized and records and digital surrogates um, are created, but original materials are returned to community members. And in this approach, it's critical to capture uh, the images at high resolution, high bit depth, and save images in the standard preservation formats because you know, those digital surrogates might be the only objects uh, in the archives. Digital preservation is another area of concern as community archives typically don't have an infrastructure to support long-term preservation of digital assets. So I want to emphasize that collaboration and community engagement really support um, uh, sustainability of community archives. Some of the risks can be minimized by collaborating with other repositories or professionals with expertise in archiving digitization and uh, preservation. I would like to highlight a quote from a seminal paper about community archives by Andrew Flynn. Uh, quote, our community archive, uh, histories and archives initiatives can play an important role in reconnecting or rooting communities which have gone through dramatic and perhaps traumatic change, whether due to industrial decline and the end of traditional occupations such as mining, dock working, and metal working, or the experience of migration and diasporic living, or other cultural, demographic, and generational shifts within um, an area, end of quote. The Park County Local History Archive that we are talking about today um, fits that uh, description from the Flint's paper really well. Indeed, the archive documents the life of a community that went through a dramatic change. The settlers arrived in Park County during the gold rush in the second part of the 19th century. Opportunities in mining, ranching, and the establishment of the railroad attracted pioneers and prospectors. 
Park County was one of the centers of gold and silver mining in Colorado. The image in this slide demonstrates a placer mine that was established during gold mining in the 19th century near the town of Alma in Park uh, County. The railroad and mining industries were closely connected and dependent on one another. The rail lines were built to accommodate mining communities to transport workers and goods. In Park County, the lines were constructed at high elevation, like the one presented in this slide, which was at Boreas Pass, and the pass is at uh, 11,000 um, feet. The vibrant mining and railroad towns disappeared after the gold rush, and many of them <laughs> actually became ghost towns. The industry is not there anymore. Park County is now a mostly rural region in the Rocky Mountains. The population of the entire country, it's a relatively large area. The population is over 16,000 uh, and the largest town, Fair Play, has around 600 residents. And that actually varies because often people don't live there uh, in winter. Although the area is not far from Denver, about an hour and a half drive, it's quite remote because of the high elevation. And it is not far from popular ski resorts like Keystone or Brackenridge, but Park County is actually less developed, not so touristy, but equally beautiful. So um, our project involved digitizing the materials from the Park County local history uh, archive and building a new digital archive. So uh, the original volunteers actually uh, created a static website uh, that is at this point outdated and it is not searchable, or the materials are not searchable. Um, and the quality of, of um, the images uh, was actually pretty poor. So part of our work was actually rescanning the photographs. The physical archive that was established uh, in 2001 by a group of volunteers collected a variety of primary resource materials and that includes over 4,000 photographs, 60 oral histories, manuscripts, newspaper, maps, and other uh, public records. The archive provides unique primary sources for researchers interested in the history of mining and railroads or the challenges of rural life in the mountain region. The volunteer group, as I mentioned, digitized part of the photographic collection and maintained a website and published several books. However, the original volunteer group was unable to continue its efforts after 20 years. Several of the key members passed away or moved away uh, from the area. The archive is currently maintained by the local government agency, Park County Department of Heritage and um, Tourism. So the digitization of the archival materials and building a new digital archive was undertaken as a collaborative effort. The studio project involved multiple partners. So some of the um, original volunteers also uh, assisted us and they became members of advisory um, group. And we sought their input on building the archive, but also selecting themes um, uh, for digital exhibits and in creating descriptive records. The Park County Department of Heritage, Tourism and Community Development the local um, government agency is now the current um, a steward of the archive, but uh, they don't have any archivists or digitization staff. So they reach out to the library information science program at the University of Denver. And that's how we actually got involved in the project. Uh, the public good uh, fund from the Uni University of Denver supported the project for two years. Once we started the project, uh, we formed a community advisory group and invited volunteers, but also other residents of Park County to get their feedback and kind of collaborate on building the archive. Uh, Colorado State Library provided an instance of Omeka Classic on your server for building the Drew archive. And the library also supports harvesting of metadata to the digital uh, public library of um, America. I'm going to turn to Alex and um, ask her to talk about digitization and the process of building um, the archive. Yeah, so this pro project focused on digitizing photographs and oral histories and um, did not digitize the manuscript collection of the archive. Of the 4,000 images in the archive, we chose and scanned uh, 1,000. Um, the archive collection is made up of original and non-original items, so we only scanned what appeared to be original photographs. The selection of the items initially took about four days. 
The scanning of the items was done in-house and in two about 500 item batches over uh, the course of two years. The first batch was scanned in 2019. And at that time, we also converted 57 tapes um, using tape players and Audacity. Um, when the pandemic started in 2020, the process had to be adjusted with the second batch of items being moved from Fair Play to Denver, as it was no longer safe uh, to take longer trips to Flair Fair Play and stay there for several days. Next slide. Um, for metadata creation, we received a spreadsheet from the archives volunteers that had basic information about each item, such as the creator, date, and some descriptive information. This information served as the basis uh, for record creation. Um, we used basic Dublin core schema um, with Omeka. The records were created by students using Excel spreadsheets and then were batch uploaded to Omeka. In 2020, this work was all done remotely using a shared Dropbox to give everybody um, access to necessary files like the spreadsheet and uh, the metadata application profile. Next slide. So this is an example of what the items and records look like in Omega, Omeka. There are quite a few photos of the Fair Play um, courthouse in uh, the archive. And actually the physical archive uh, is located there or was once located there. Um, things did not always run smoothly in the creation of metadata. In 2019, after the first batch of items had been completed and the advisory group um, sent a new spreadsheet after they had looked at our records um, with updated information. And this meant that a significant portion of the records had to be revised, including revising many of the copyright statements um, we had designed. Um, revisions took about two months. Um, while com community feedback on this project has been great, um, it can make the process longer as there is a constant feedback loop of information, especially as community members are actively um, completing their own research into these places and photographs and people. Um, that means that like there's a constant um, flow of information that means records need to be updated. Next slide. So an important part of this project was accessing copyright and assigning rights statements to every object. Uh, rights metadata plays an important role in providing users information for the reuse of items. Um, for this project, we developed a framework that divided uh, copyright um, by published and unpublished work and then by date of creation. Um, developing this framework was a process of constant revision that is still ongoing. It can be difficult to assign right statements for items that maybe have no creation date or have a really broad estimation of what the creation date might be. For instance, we have some that say, you know, it might have been created at the end of the 19th century or all the way to the mid uh, 20th century. And it can be hard to determine um, whether that's something that's in public domain or still in copyright. Um, next slide. So uh, geotagging was one of the last focuses um, of the project. Several hundred objects have been geotagged um, in the digital archive. Omeka provides a simple system for geotagging records and um, provides a map for users, um, such as the example you see on the slide. The challenge with geotagging items in the collection was the fact that many of the places photographed no longer exist. Um, some are buildings that have been torn down, so we don't know exactly where they would have been located in places like Fair Play, but also many photos depict old mining towns or mines that no longer exist. Finding the geographic locations for these places can be tricky. There are not always good records for the rural mining towns that have disappeared um, after the gold rush in Colorado. I'm going to turn it over to Wendy, who's going to tell you a little bit about our exhibits and sustainability. Thanks, Alex. Um, so what you can see from here is that we have created three different collections, photographs, an oral histories, and a manuscripts. And the manuscripts, is, as was mentioned, is a work in progress because the physical items are at the archive and they still need to be sorted and organized prior to digitizing. However, the oral histories, next slide, please. Um, they have been digitized and uploaded. There were originally, the tapes were all found in a stored in a cardboard box. And from that, we have digitized 57 oral histories and interviews. 
many that are multiple tapes and conducted with individuals who lived in the Park County area for extended periods of time. The majority of these were created around 2005, but three were created in 1979 and 1980. Because of the preservation risk of the tapes, they were prioritized for digitization. The conversion uh, was done in-house with a cassette tape player and Audacity software, which is free and open source digital audio editor and recording application. All included transcripts, signed consent forms, and summaries and keywords describing each interview. The transcripts and consent forms were converted to PDFs, so we could also upload those as well. And it was pretty straightforward creating the metadata because we had so much information. There were two recordings we did not include because one was incomplete and one had a consent that did not allow it to be used online. The exhibits that we have done, um, we have four exhibits currently. They focus on towns and settlements, mining history, history of the railroads in the area and the ranching industry. Students in a digital libraries class created all the exhibits, but we have tried to unify the exhibits with some standardized elements like the fonts, banners, colors, and layouts. This example from the railroad exhibit exemplifies the idea of creating an exhibit using a broad topic important to the area's history that was then subdivided into separate pages that include a balance of historical narrative along with photographs from the archive. Next slide. Plains to Peak, Peaks Collective is the local service hub for harvesting data to the DPLA. And in September and October of 2020, we first tried to harvest the data, but the Omeka.net system that we were originally using only harvested the metadata and would not pick up the thumbnails. We contacted the host and they said they would fix it, but that never happened. And that was probably a bit fortuitous because then we were able to reach out to the Colorado State Library about a collaboration with their virtual library site. And they, included to, they agreed to include the archive under their umbrella. They, however, use Omeka Classic. So in December, we migrated all of our data to their system and surprisingly had very few problems. It wasn't perfect, but it was better than we had expected. And now, uh, as you can see on the next slide, the harvesting works and all the items can be viewed on the DPLA site as well as locally. Next slide. As for any small community archive, sustainability is the goal. We believe that Bark County Archive has been established in a way that will ensure it continues. The community and members are excited about this resource and have even found funding and to hire a part-time researcher. It's not an archivist, but we feel like it's better than nothing. They also will continue to collaborate with the Colorado State Library, which has the advantage of providing them some technical assistance with Omeka and DU is committed to staying involved and helping to find students to assist while continuing to apply for grants. The archive has also continued to receive new donations, including three that came in during the pandemic. They got another oral history, photographs of the interviewee of the oral history and a donation of some glass plate negatives from the late 19th century. They're committing to using the post-custodial practices, gathering the materials, scanning at high-res images and returning the originals to the owner and have donors that right now who are willing to sign consents for digital donation with rights and non and non commercial use. We created this, they also have created a community outreach program and are continuing to source and scan originals hoping to find and reconstruct some of the archive materials. We do need to acknowledge at this time that the archive only includes the white settlers perspective and recognize that there were many immigrants, including Chinese laborers in the area. Also the Native American Ute tribe originally inhabited the land and area where they were and were forced out by the non-natives. The exhibits we've tried to use to also address these issues and acknowledge this gap while providing a more diverse perspective. And the archive is reaching out to researchers and others in the community to see if more information exists that will help us address this diversity gap. And with that, we thank you. Thank you, session one presenters. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat. We'll give it just a few moments um, in case folks are currently thinking and collecting their thoughts before we move to our second presentation.
in this this moment, if any of our presenters would like to share, presenter first presenters like to share any um, kind of quick thoughts or reflections as as we see if folks have questions, you're welcome to do that. I just wanted to add that it was not part of our presentation, but kind of halfway through the project, I conducted like an evaluation study, um, uh, asking for feedback from our community um, members. So 24 uh, people participated in the study through an online survey, but also uh, through um, a qualitative interviews. And the information that, that uh, we gathered through that study, I, it helped us actually to, I think, revise uh, uh, the collection. So one of the comments, like the digital exhibits that were created by students in the digital library uh, class had all kinds of different designs <laughs> because these were just group projects in, in two different classes. But you know, one of the uh, comments that we received for the study was that you know the lack of, of uniform design was was not good for you know end user experience. So part of the revisions that we um, uh, did um, later on, based on that feedback, was sort of to pro provide relatively uniform uh, design, and then moving the. Uh, site to Omeka Classic also allowed us to customize the design a little bit, which was not feasible, you know, to that extent in Omeka.net. Uh, so some of that information from the evaluation study actually uh, influenced how we revised the site in, in Omeka Classic. So we do have one question, if I can have the presenters in maybe one minute uh, respond so we can move to the next presentation. Um, have you run into any issues pertaining to access with the county due to broadband use? Thank you, Jacob Sherman, for that question. Uh, that's a great question. <laughs> Actually, it is a major issue in, in Park, Park County. Um, so a lot of that work was actually done uh, offline um, when we were working there. And then due to the pandemic, actually we had to shift to remote work. And um, I mean, most of the uh, record building uh, with Omeka, we did it from Denver, not, not, not from Park County, but I do acknowledge that uh, broadband issue in that area is pretty serious. Um, even in the county building, uh, we had problems with accessing the internet. Thank you to, for that wonderful presentation um, to each of the three presenters. I would now like to transition to our second presentation today in session 2C. I would like to invite Miracle Hanke and Kevin Price um, to go ahead and begin. Thank you. So good afternoon. Um, I hope you can see the screen that I'm sharing. Uh, thank you for um, hosting us today. Um, pleased to be here. As uh, Rachel mentioned, my name is Mirko Hanke. I'm a librarian at the UT Libraries at Austin, um, working as the Digital Asset Management System Coordinator. Um, and I'll be presenting today with my colleague, Kevin Price, who's a software developer and analyst in the library's IT department. Even while many of us have been working under drastically different circumstances, a lot has happened over the last year in the cultural heritage sector, and patrons have become used to more content than ever before being available online. And even in non pandemic times, which we're all looking forward to, it is convenient and actually can save significant time and money and possibly even help save the planet if you can avoid travel. Um, over the course of the past year at UT Libraries, we reached a milestone of making over 20,000 digital images and digitally reformatted books and serial issues available on our collections portal, which is the UT Libraries access point, public access point for digitized content from our own collections. What was missing was 
a way to publish audiovisual or time-based media content to that portal as well. And today we want to talk about a, a development project which added that functionality to handle audiovisual content in our collections portal. This project was an undertaking that involved multiple teams from the UT Libraries IT department, a group of librarians who served as project stakeholders, and it involved the curators of UT Libraries collections that are using our digital asset management infrastructure. The different pieces of this project have come together only a few weeks ago, after about seven months of development. Um, so most of what we'll be talking about today is really, really fresh from the press for us. Um, we're currently in a soft launch stage, um, so you should consider this presentation a tech demo, a tech preview. Um, as a bit of context, um, UT libraries have been digitally reformatting various types of carriers from their physical collections for essentially decades and have built a sizable collection of digitized content for preservation as well as for use by uh, curators and patrons. And that includes significant amounts of digitized audio and audiovisual content, again, coming from a variety of source media carriers. Just uh, those few numbers as an illustration of why we want to make um, this content more conveniently accessible. Um, only between 2017 and 2020 alone, our digitization services unit created data that uh, is approximately equivalent to 2,000 hours of audio and about uh, 2,600 hours of moving image. So the video and the video star have had a second life for quite a while on tape at UT Libraries, and we've been um, steadily producing um, digital content from um, our physical collections. Um, what we have been wanting for a while was a tool for curators to manage any kind of digital asset, not just audio and video, conveniently and sustainably, and for a way to make that more conveniently accessible, and ideally to do that at scale. To serve that goal, we have been building out our digital asset management ecosystem over the past years, and it currently consists of um, three different components. The digital asset management system, or DAMS proper, um, which allows curators to ingest, describe, and manage content through a convenient interface with little mediation necessary, and the collections portal as a public search and discovery interface. The separation of these two systems allows our curators maximum control over which of the content they're managing in the dams they want to make publicly available. Um, these two systems, the collections portal and the dams, are uh, also separate software systems um, built on different software stacks. The dams that you can see on the left side of the screen is an instance of Island Rover 7, which is an open source software framework to build digital asset management systems. And the collections portal um, that you can see on the right is a stack that um, that contains a IIIF image server. Um, it uses the open source discovery tool Blacklight, um, which in turn uses the Mirador viewer component for displaying images of paged content. Kevin, my colleague Kevin, will go into a bit more detail about the stack. The third component that's not easily visible, but that's very important in this ecosystem, is a custom bridge, our publishing app, um, which copies. Um, images or media files from the dam site to the storage location that we use for public access. Um, it also creates the IIIF manifests that allow the viewer component and the collections for the display images or sequences of images and associated metadata. Now, while the focus of this presentation is on the publicly visible upgrades to the collections portal, the public interface, a large portion um, of our developer time went into work to upgrade and extend that publishing app to allow us to actually publish audio and video. So we now have a very shiny new bridge app. Um, from the outset, our collections collection portal infrastructure, which was added in 2018 and 2019, um, has been leaning heavily on IIIF, the International Image Interoperability Framework. That framework has gained quite a bit of traction over the past years. If you 
probably know, it's a family of specifications um, that standardize software behavior to serve and present images and associated metadata. Until last summer, the IIII framework's been predominantly tailored towards image-based media. As quite a bit of good news for us, um, last summer, the latest version of the IIIF presentation API was released. <coughs> And with that, the IIIF, IIIF presentation API became officially capable of supporting time-based media. With that um, bit of good news and with that, those uh, components in place, we set out to define a project with the following goals. We wanted to be able to publish audio and video content from our dams to the portal. We want to allow users to consume content that is in uh, the portal um, through a player app. And probably most important of all, we want to be able to do the above while um, meeting accessibility requirements. Each of these goals, um, as it turned out, as the project, um, uh, project uh, moved along, came with te some technological challenges. We did want to continue to build our ecosystem using IIIF. So the developers needed to find a player application that supports IIIF version three compliant manifests. And uh, that uh, the app also needed to work with the other components that are in place. The content that we make publicly available also needs to be captioned. We need to provide a transcript as an alternative textual representation. And as I mentioned, this is actually quite an important requirement because we would be facing a legal risk um, if we didn't, so we need to be in compliance with state or federal law and the technical norms that the laws reference. This in turn means that the captions file needs to be provided when the media is published. The publishing app has to um, be able to bring that to the public site. And the player application that we want to use has to be able to handle and display captions. This legal requirement um, of providing uh, an alternative textual representation ultimately is also not just a technological challenge, but um, a curatorial challenge. And this um, curatorial challenge um, is, this is, it's a curatorial challenge for our curators and collection managers. In addition to the descriptive metadata um, that they have to uh, create in order to publish content, they also need to provide a different kind of metadata that is and um, yeah, orders of magnitude more time consuming to create. Um, this particular curatorial challenge was a charge for a group of our project stakeholders from the business side that included um, Anna Lamp here, Corinne Forsberg, David Bliss, and also um, initially Ben Chang. We worked with uh, UT's captioning services, which luckily for us uh, happened to be an organizational unit of the libraries. Um, we developed internal guidelines and documentation um, that allows curators to uh, uh, provide a workflow and, and guidance uh, for curators to create captions and transcripts as part of the metadata creation process. Um, our captioning services also um, have tools available that we can, to some extent, reuse, for instance, for creating a first pass automated transcript. Um, curators can uh, use, uh, can order the services of our captioning services unit um, if they decide um, that this is a, a faster and more convenient option for them. Um, this option is, however, contingent on the availability of funds for a particular collection um, because the captioning services unit is required to recover cost. Um, and with this, um, I'm going to hand it over for Kevin um, for more details on the development process and the technology that the developers use. Um, we're currently at the stage that the technology is in place. Our curators are using the guidelines and model workflows that we have um, created to create captions and transcripts. And we hope to see um, content rolling up very soon. With that, I want to hand it over to Kevin. Great. Uh, can I get the next, next slide, please? Thank you. 
Cool. So as Mirka mentioned, uh, my name is Kevin Price. I am a software developer and analyst with the libraries, and I have uh, not a lot of time to get through a lot of very heavy technical concepts, so I'm going to move sort of fast. Uh, the important part here is we have two separate development teams um, that typically work on separate projects that don't uh, intermingle, but this time they happen to. So the Valkyrie squad worked mostly on the publishing process that Mirka mentioned earlier, while my squad worked a lot on the uh, front end components of it. Um, and we are an agile shop for both squads. So we, we do a lot of like iterative development um, and a lot of communication between them. Uh, can I get next slide, please? Great. So the first part of it, the publishing process, which is that kind of bridge between the two services, the dams and the collections portal. Um, this is basically a brief overview of how it works. Um, we decided to build it out as a microservice architecture uh, for one to adhere to sort of where the industry is moving uh, and allow for scalability. And also because it moves a lot of the processing power off of the dam server and into um, sort of its own little microcosm. So it, it's, it's taking a lot of the stress off of our other components. Um, and it also allows these microservices to be called independently of this publishing process. So uh, it becomes especially important with the manifest generator. If a, somebody has some asset that they want to generate a manifest for, uh, they can call that independently of going through the entire process and generate a V3 manifest for it. Um, with that, though, if someone is going to go through the publishing request, uh, we sort of have this publishing microservice, which acts as the controlling microservice for everything else. And that kicks off uh, the move microservice, the manifest generator, and the solar microservice. And the solar microservice is sort of the most important factor of that, um, because that is what the collections portal actually ingests and um, stores references to both the AAAF manifest and all the metadata. Uh, and the manifest stores the reference to the actual item in our Curio server, which is what the move microservice is responsible for doing. Uh, it just puts a copy of that asset in Curio so we can reference it all the way up. Um, and that sort of generates a WoWs a streaming link uh, to accomplish that streaming thing that we, we talked about earlier. Can I get to the next slide, please? <clears throat> Great. So this is what you've all been waiting for, uh, the full tech stack for the collections portal that Mirko mentioned earlier. Um, on the bottom level, we have a Docker uh, container environment, which essentially acts as a wrapper for the whole thing. Um, that, if anyone is interested in looking into, is really important for like uh, developer happiness. Um, it kind of allows the environment to be pushed up into any other place. So like uh, all of our local development environment is exactly the same as when you push it up to the server. Um, now, that's in theory and practice. There are some different configurations that you have to do, but it makes it a lot easier. Um, also, from there, we have Ruby on Rails and Blacklight. Um, and that's sort of the framework that we work with. Uh, we have Yarn as a package manager. We use Webpacker to compile all of the assets, uh, which is like the JavaScript and style sheet assets, and then React as the front end framework. Um, and then, like I said earlier, all the content is served through Wowza streaming links, uh, which are referenced in the IIIF manifest. And those are direct links to the Curio server. Uh, next slide, please. So the main meat of this whole project really comes into um, that Ruby on, Revel, Ruby on Rails level of the tech stack. Uh, and that is through the Rails asset pipeline. So typically what Rails will do is use sprockets to compile all of your uh, JavaScript and CSS style sheets into a single file for each of those um, through which the controller will mash together the views that you've written with those single files and display that to the user. Um, and Sprockets is actually replaced with Webpack in Rails 6 and up. And since we're using Rails 5.2, uh, we had to do that manually. It wasn't done for us. But essentially, if you look at this graph, it, it goes in the same, uh, does the same exact thing where it just compiles all the assets. Uh, so you might be wondering, you know, why do it at all? Why not just leave sprockets there? And if I can get the next slide. Um, 
There's a lot of reasons to do it. For one, it's super easy to install and it does the same thing. The main reason that we wanted to replace it is that uh, it actually allows us to use React to deliver well, React components. Um, and that's really important because that's what Mirror 3 and the Triple IF React Media Player is based on, that framework. Um, and sort of a free added benefit that we got here was the live reloading of components. So instead of having to kill your container and bring it back up every time you want to see a change, all you have to do is like refresh your browser screen and it's there. Um, next slide, please. Great. So the actual front end technologies are uh, Mirador 3 and the IIIF React Media Player. Um, and we had already actually been using Mirador 2 before we did this upgrade. Um, and during the upgrade, Mirador 3 launched with full AV support, which we were really excited about because that was not on their roadmap. Uh, but we found that it couldn't actually handle the streaming links from our Wowza. And so we kind of had to find something else to deliver the AV content, um, which is when we found the IIIF React Media Player uh, which Indiana University was developing and tried that one out. And unfortunately it was uh, so early in its stage of de development that it was broken when we tried to put it in. Um, so we actually reached out to them and they invited us to the Semvera developer conference where they kicked off a community sprint with Northwestern University. And actually through that got the player to a usable state like a beta stage that we could actually put it in and use it. Um, and a huge shout out to Indiana University for doing that, because without them, this would not be the same project. <laughs> so we really thank them. Um, with that, though, that's essentially all of the development on the front end that we did. Um, and I will pass it back over to Mirko for a live demo. Thank you very much. Um, me switch um, to a different tab. And as I mentioned, we're still in the process of pulling out um, actual collections on our production site. So the technology is already in place and we can, we're waiting for content to um, come to the production site. Uh, some of the tech, um, test content um, on, our, uh, on our staging or test system mm is uh, in this case like a public domain or and now like movie in the public domain that we've added some uh, subtitles and it's for a couple of minutes and you can see um, it is playing in the uh, interface of our um, of our portal um, there is a download link to a um, oh, yeah, singing uh, download link to the to the transcript file. Um, the metadata is in place, um, and all of that is uh, encapsulated for um, transportability into a um, into a uh, triple F manifest. That's what I was going to say. Um, this is the manifest files that we're creating now and that actually drive this display. And with that, um, thank you very much for um, following and joining today. Thank you, Mirko and Kevin, our two se uh, second presentation presenters, excuse me, that was fascinating. And certainly having these two presentations shared in the same session highlights some you know, common and familiar themes to many of us around ideas of collaboration, metadata, standards, curatorial work. Um, I am keeping an eye on the chat and also the clock. I wanna be respectful of everyone's time. We do have just a couple of minutes. So if you have any thoughts or questions you'd like to share, please do put those in the chat in Hoover. And as folks collect their thoughts, uh, Mirko and Kevin, if you have any um, last thoughts or ideas you'd like to share, um, I invite you to do that now as well. Um, 
think um, Kevin mentioned this earlier already. Um, the developers use um, quite a bunch of um, very interesting and um, cutting edge technology. So if other um, developers or um, other librarians and staff from other institutions present today are interested in more details than we can present in 20 minutes, um, feel free to reach out to um, either one of us, or like if it's a technological question, then obviously Kevin would be the first person to reach out to. Um, and I believe our, our contact data is, in, is available on Hoopa. We do have a question, excuse me, that just came in from Todd Peters. Thank you, Todd. What is the backend storage server? It's not Fedora, but Curio? Yes. Um, we actually do use an instance of Fedora for. Um, so, so the, um, the Islandora portion uses Fedora 3. That's the storage backend for the actual digital asset management system. And as I explained, there are two separate systems um, that we use. One is really just staff only for management, and the other one is the public facing um, portal site. And that has a dedicated storage um, location that we call Curio, but that's a publicly accessible location. We wouldn't want to make our Fedora publicly accessible. So as a follow-up, um, the assets are in two different locations. Um, I don't know if Kevin can say more to that. Effectively, yes. Effectively, yes. And that, that's what that move microservice actually does is, is copies it over to the second location so that it can be served through the streaming link. Wonderful. We unfortunately are already at time. How it goes by so quickly. Um, just a few things I would like to share. First, a thank you to our presenters for those inspiring and thoughtful presentations. There are also several posters that folks here who found this topic interesting might be interested in viewing. And I will um, paste that in the chat in Whova, a list of potential posters for you all to check out. As you might've heard, there's also a scavenger hunt um, with our poster. So that'll be something you wanna check out as well. I would like to encourage everyone here to join us for upcoming TDL sessions. And please take a look again at the posters. Lastly, TDL is looking to gauge interest in forming a new member group around research integrity. This is building on the success of our brief research integrity workshop series back in February. We have a survey for you to take to help us iron out some details around this group. And I'll paste that link into the chat as well. Um, so I'll keep this open for a few moments and paste those links in chat. You're welcome to hang out uh, before the next session begins. Thank you all for attending. Rachel, thank you very much for moderating the session. Oh, it was my pleasure. This was so interesting and I love how they were paired together. Thank you. And thank you for uh, to our colleagues for presenting with us. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>